Welcome to the presentation of our newly open source DLR Thermophilic Stream Library. I'm Michael Meister and I will start this talk with an introductory example. Suppose we want to simulate the air conditioning and electronics cooling system of a battery electric vehicle. We would start by adding heat ports to all the components we want to cool, like the drive chain and the battery, as well as to some heating elements like the battery and the PTC that can be used to heat up the cabin air if needed. Now we need some means of getting the heat in and out of the fluid. For this, we can use the conduction element, which is a control volume around the fluid and a heat port, as well as a conservation of energy equation. With this, we can add a glycol loop around all the electronic components. And because we have to break all of the closed fluid loops with a volume element, we add a reservoir upstream of the pump. We close the glycol loop with a radiator and a cooling airstream. The cabin air has to be cooled by vapor cycle because sometimes we want to cool it below ambient temperatures. So we add a vapor cycle with compressor, radiator and accumulator in this case, pressure control valve, a valve to switch off the cycle completely and a evaporator that takes on heat from the cabin air. We close the vapor cycle with a condenser that is cooled with another cooling airstream. We could be done now, but sometimes we also want to use our vapor cycle to cool the electronics. So we add another evaporator parallel to the first one. Sometimes we don't want to cool the electronics at all. So we add bypasses for both of the heat exchangers. And in some cases, it might be beneficial to split the glycol loop into two loops, one for the battery and one for the drive chain and charger. This is beneficial sometimes in some configurations. Now we have two loops and we have to split the second loop also with a reservoir now let's look how this looks in Daimler. We have the component I just described here. It is connected to a cabin air model and to some electric components. All of them are modeled simply by a, a thermal capacitor and a prescribed heat flow. You can also see some heuristics um, for the inputs and switch positions, positions of the system. On the left, you can see the battery temperature. It starts quite cold and gets warmer as we add more heat. Now, if we start the simulation, um, at the beginning, you can see the battery is quite cold. So we want to heat it with the battery heater and we want the heat to only arrive at the battery. So we split our loops and bypass both the um, heat exchangers. As soon as the temperature will cross the first um, temperature threshold, we want to switch off the battery heater and we want the heat from the drive train to arrive at the battery. So we combine our loops into a combined cooling loop while still bypassing both the heat exchangers. When we reach the next temperature threshold, we want to passively cool the whole system. So we disable this bypass and let, the, let, let this radiator cool the whole system. When we cross the next temperature threshold, we want to cool the battery with the wiper cycle. Um, so we split the loops because we still want to cool the drive chain with the radiator. And uh, disable this bypass. Now we are cooling the battery over the wiper cycle. Finally, at the end of the simulation, we reach the last temperature threshold. Here we prior prioritize battery cooling by disabling this valve, basically giving up on cooling the cabin air and using the full cooling power of the vapor cycle to cool down the battery. You see, uh, the simulation took about 60 seconds and is quite fast, although initialization and some switches take some time. If we finally look at the statistics of the model, we can see we have 105 states. We have no large nonlinear systems and we have a purely linear initialization problem in this case. This is due to our approach uh, of modeling, of building the library, which Dirk will now explain to you. The reason that there are no large nonlinear equation systems is that we use a special decomposition of the pressure P into the steady mass flow pressure P hat and the inertial pressure R. Where the inertial pressure is only dependent on the mass flow acceleration and on the geometry of the flow, it is independent on the thermodynamic state of the fluid. And we can exploit this fact by putting all the equations for the mass flow acceleration into a linear implicit form as indicated by the green rectangle on the right. If you then choose to use the steady mass flow pressure P hat for your thermodynamic state computation, you can bring all the remaining equations into an explicit form. 
Essentially, you compute your components from source to sync in a downstream fashion. In order to achieve this very favorable form, you have to rigorously implement it at each single component and we hence developed a normal form where you describe the um, thermodynamic outlet state as a function f of the thermodynamic inlet state, the internal state x, its derivative, the mass flow rate and the potential inputs u. If you adhere to that, you're guaranteed to avoid the nonlinear equations altogether. I recommend you study the um, citation below. It provides very valuable background information. In our practical implementation for this library, we haven't been quite as strict. And after all, the code has to be readable and understandable. Also, small implicit equation systems can be tolerated if they are well-natured. In theory, you could solve all problems uh, by an excessive use of the internal state x. Of course, we try to avoid it. Also, it is not always easy um, to find a regular form for the function f, especially for zero mass flow in heat exchangers or turbo components. And in fact, we use zero mass flow as our default initialization. So you can naturally ramp up the system and this actually helps a great deal with the initialization problem. There are a few special cases we shall discuss. We decided to not contain any geometric information in the uh, connector in our library since many thermodynamic processes can be adequately described without it. However, sometimes you are interested in the geometry and then there are these special green colored components that take the total pressure balance into account and compute the dynamic pressure from the geometry. You can use that, for instance, uh, to model a Venturi pump as depicted below. Also, I said before that you can compute downstream well, this implies that you know your flow direction. This is not always the case as here in this example of a reversible heat pump. You know it for the pump, but you don't know it for the heat exchangers. So we provide an interface and certain components for the non-directed case. However, we still recommend to use the directed components when you know the flow direction. It's a too valuable information to throw away. All of what you have seen so far would be um, of hardly any value if you wouldn't have proper media models. So of course we support the MSL media. We had to do a small local copy of it because we slightly extended the interface. This will be updated in the MSL and then we can remove our local copy. A big thank you goes to XRG Simulation and Stefan Bischhusen. They decided to open up uh, their valuable two-phase media models and hence if you want to model these refrigerant cycles. Um, this goes very well together with these media models. Um, uh, they're directly part of the library. Also, we are working uh, on a wrapper for the TIL media interface, but uh, this is probably going to be a Daimola specific solution, at least for the short term. Well, if we compare that um, to what uh, is, let's say, more common um, in the um, community who models such uh, thermal fluids uh, systems. Well, the algebraic approach is quite common where you avoid uh, the states as much as possible, but it does scale badly because for complex architectures you get very complicated nonlinear equation systems that are simply very difficult to solve. And you can avoid that by applying an ODE approach where you have volume flow, volume flow, volume flow, volume flow, etc. Well, that works, but you end up with many, many states. Hence, we try to find here uh, the golden middle ground. Um, we can avoid the nonlinear equation systems, but we also have fewer states because we can share the mass flow rate between the components and use index reduction. So I think this makes this a very attractive solution. However, we went beyond to that. Uh, we also recognized many libraries are very complicated. They have a high entry barrier. They are difficult to read. So we really put effort into it to make our library easy to read, easy to understand so that you can develop um, your own components if needed. And my colleague is now going to tell you about that. Yeah, welcome everybody from my side. My name is Niels Weber and I'm going to show you how to use and easily adapt our library to your own needs by adding new components. And for that, let's have a look at a very simple example system let's assume we want to model a hydrostatic transmission 
where we want to convert fluid energy created by the pump to shaft power by the use of a hydraulic motor. And we want to control the mass flow through the motor by a switching valve. At the beginning, let's have a look at the simple loop. And from the introductory, we, we know that we have to break every loop with a volume element as it is done here. And by adding a switching valve and the hydraulic motor, we could complete our system. But as we take a look into our library, we realize that the hydraulic motor is not yet included, so we have to add it on our own. As it is a single input, single output component, we can inherit from the available base class and add some textbook equations and test the component to see if it works properly. So let's go through it step by step. As mentioned before, we can extend from the base class CISO flow that includes all the equations that are required to fulfill our modeling approach. After that, we can add the textbook equations to the equation section of our component. Special care has to be taken for the enthalpy difference calculation because we are dividing by the mass flow and we have to prevent it to be zero. So we introduce some mass flow normalization here. Now our component is ready to be tested in a small test model, which could look somehow like this. And when we translate the model, we see that after index reduction, we still have a nonlinear equation system by the size of two. In general, it's not problematic, but we always aim to have nonlinear equation system with the maximum size of one. So we want to get rid of it. And to get rid of it, we need to understand where it comes from. So we take a deeper look into the equations that we implemented before. And we see that the volume flow is dependent on the mass flow. The angular velocity is also a function of the mass flow. The fluid torque is dependent on the derivative of the angular velocity and hence becomes a function of the derivative of the mass flow. And the pressure drop is also a function of the derivative of the mass flow. As we know from the theoretical part of this talk, we uh, want to bring all our equations to the required form that the outlet is only dependent on the mass flow itself and not the derivative of the mass flow. So here we are violating our modeling approach and we need to find a solution for that. And one way to overcome it would be to apply a low pass filter on the volume flow to move it to the state vector. So the filtered volume flow becomes part of the state vector. And when we have another look at the equations now, we see that they are all dependent on the state vector or the derivative of the state vector. And we are good with the structure of our equations and we are fulfilling the required form and the nonlinear equation system should disappear. In the code, we would add this equation here to filter the volume flow and use the filter volume flow to calculate our angular velocity. And therefore, the nonlinear equation system disappears. Now we can run our simulation model and periodically switch the valve during simulation to let fluid flow through the hydraulic motor and create some shaft power when needed. This small example shows how easily you can add new components and what you have to take care of when you add equations straight from textbook to still maintain the required structure. Last but not least, you might wonder where to get our library. You find it on GitHub. Feel free to contribute, use the issue tracker or leave us some feedback. We are always happy to improve our library. Furthermore, we did some testing on different tools. So if you have Daimola available, we would always recommend to use Daimola because all releases are running in Daimola. Also, we made some latest or later releases run on OpenModelica too, but there are still some minor issues that should be fixed in the future. There was also some testing on Model on Impact, but the tool is not available for us. So we are relying on external testing for the moment, but it should run there as well. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed our talk. And if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A session or contact us directly by email. Thank you. Goodbye.